they were talking about how Biden's approval collapsed after the Afghan withdrawal. And instead of making the point that Joe Biden botched the withdrawal and uh, Ian goes off calling it a surrender, <laughs> I mean, it seems on purpose. They said it was a bad play by Trump and Biden shouldn't have followed through instead of it was the right play by Trump and mm. Biden intentionally, in my opinion, s flubbed the whole thing. Everything. But but this is the point. This is what we the reason why I'll say intentionally now, in my opinion, is that at the time we were asking, did Biden screw this up on purpose? to sour the idea of withdrawal in the minds of the American public. The reality was you could withdraw from Afghanistan without causing what, what, what Biden caused. But now what I'm seeing is journalists say Trump's plan was bad and Biden is getting blamed for it. Well, no, no, Biden's plan, plan was, was bad. Trump put the plan in place way earlier in the spring. That's he had right. made that promise. And there were plenty of opportunities to get started on that withdrawal. And it what happened look, was, no, I, I hear what you're saying. The Biden administration refused to get started on the withdrawal and it's, so they had to do it the last minute it's not just that it's they they abandoned bagram in the middle of yeah, the night without telling the afghani security it. forces mm -hmm. they left all well, they, they i think they turned it over to the to the ana but the ana couldn't hold in it the, in the middle of the night yeah the uh, u.s forces pulled out without without notice and s regular afghanis just looted the the, the buildings and uh, uh uh there were uh helicopter pilots I think this is like New York Times reporting that instantly lost logistics and didn't know what was going on, landed the helicopters and ran away Yeah, because they were like, there's no one anymore. No, I'm not talking. There was it was just it was an insane, insane move. And I think what they wanted. Yes, Joe Biden uh, gets the negativity from it, but they don't think Joe. I, I do not see Joe Biden being the candidate in 2024. It makes literally no sense. He's there. He's their their sacrificial lamb, their scapegoat. Now, what they're going to do, and they're starting to do it, is saying, you see what happens when we withdraw? It's right. chaos. American side. We can't. We have to stay and keep the right. troops overseas. Everything, well, go well, ahead. Go everything also, that was bad about the, the, uh, the withdrawal from Afghanistan was all tactics. It was not none of it was policy. Like well, no, I well, just agree. It was, that. It wait, was wait, wait, insane wait. how they left all of the all of the weapons. But yeah. now what we have is the Taliban saying, "If you give me safe passage, we'll destroy Israel for you." Well, they're not getting anywhere near Israel. Check the map again. Put the map right. up. I'm just saying that's that's <laughs> but, that, that, that is the goal okay, of the wait, Taliban. Wait, wait. Is to now here's the thing, Israel. though. So look, you make a great point about the narrative here about oh yeah, see what happens when you ever leave anywhere, something <laughs> bad happens, right? <laughs> you're you're right. I don't believe that that was the reason that they did what they did, though. And I can explain why. Here's what they did. Okay. Trump, as she said, absolutely correctly, Libby said, Trump's deal was we leave by May 1st. We're out by May the 1st. Okay. That's the start of the fighting season, right? Everything's yeah. frozen over until the summertime essentially comes. That's the start of the fighting season. We were supposed to be gone by then. Biden came in and said, well, I don't want to live yep. up to Trump's deal. I want it to be my Afghan withdrawal, not Trump's Afghan withdrawal. And I don't want people to be able to say that I did what Trump said I had to do and this and that. <laughs> so what did he do? He kicked the can down the road for four months to September, which remember they said, we're going to do it September 11th. Yeah. Like, what do they do? Just public right. relations. And, and people you had are crazy. in Afghanistan, they were like, uh, you kind of promised. Right. But here's the deal that you guys need to understand about the war. OK, the war was lost. They had to leave, okay? Bush and Obama lost that war before Trump ever got there. The Taliban were ascendant. They controlled 60% of the country in the daytime. They controlled 80 or more percent of it at night. Part of it was the they only didn't know way, what a win looks like. They didn't know yeah, what a win the, would look the like. The policy well, was wrong. Look, let's just stick with the withdrawal here for a second. If Biden was going to tell the truth to the American people about that war, he would have had to tell them, listen, we lost. The government that we built has no popular support. It cannot stand. The military that we built has no popular support. It cannot stand. We failed. We're leaving. But he couldn't do that, right? He had to say, what did he say? He said, we won the war. It was great. <laughs> we built a great government in Kabul, which will surely last for years. And we built this great, magnificent Afghan National Army, 300,000 men strong. And it's sure to last for years, too. That's why we can leave. Not because we blew it, but because we did it, everybody. And so now we can go. Well, by sticking to that lie... That meant they had to leave all those weapons in the hands of the Afghan National Army that couldn't <laughs> hold on to them and ended up turning them all over to the Taliban. And because they had to pretend that they had created a government worth its salt in Kabul, 
they couldn't abandon it and leave the city early or they would have been accused of undermining the government and being the reason that it fell. But so they had to stick with their lie that everything is fine. Meanwhile, the Taliban are walking right into Kabul because it's four months behind schedule that they're leaving. And you know, and you know what else comes from this with the Taliban getting access to a lot of these weapons? Certainly they can't maintain a lot of it. So a lot of it right. just instantly falls Shelf apart. Life, yeah. But with a lot of the guns and the, uh, the, the, the materials that are available to just ground forces, it allows the U.S. to have a recurring problem and reason to be in the Middle East. It's Possibly. also, they are also... Um, Hard to get back to Afghanistan. Yeah, I mean... But it's not even necessarily Afghanistan, about Afghanistan. Been... It's the reporting that, or the rumors at least, that weapons left behind by the U.S. are being used by Hamas sure. and other yeah. and other. Uh, yeah, that was militants. reporting from the Wall Street Journal. They yeah. were reporting right. about that in in June that that was likely to be happening. Yeah. And there's also reports that the technology has been reverse engineered, I, and like that they're able to build. You know, we saw that stuff. video of them trying to fly a helicopter, and they're like going yeah. in circles when or whatever. Come, when yeah. it comes, to, they can make AK-47. Yeah, when it comes right. to the small yeah. arms, they're like there's yeah. there's. They're building AK-47s and they're building at least small arms in the sure. mountains of Afghanistan between yeah. uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan. There's there's a, a whole arms market up there where you can go and buy copies of of fully like automatic. Like Louis Vuitton handbags, you know what? except <laughs> AK-47s. Exactly. Let me tell you a story, though. Here's how my first book that was this book about all of the terror wars became... A different book, Fool's Errand, about Afghanistan. It's because I got stuck in Afghanistan because it's such <laughs> a huge story. It's 20 years long, and but the whole thing takes place east of Persia. And then and so I knew it was people are going to be mad at me that it takes too long before we get to Iraq War II. So I ended up, you know what? Fine. I'll just do a whole book about Afghanistan. And I'll get back to the, to the rest of the Middle East later because the rest of the whole story of the Bush and Obama years takes place in Mesopotamia and the Levant. What's going on in Afghanistan is, I hate to say it, but almost irrelevant in a you, sense. It's separate from the rest of the story, whereas the war in Iraq immediately bleeds to Libya, to Syria, and the rest of the story comes from Bush Jr.'s invasion of Iraq War II in 03. Do you think religion uh, plays a role in high-level uh, military? Uh, I'm trying to be careful here. Uh, obviously, religion plays a role to varying degrees, but do you think that actual, like, uh, revelatory religious fanaticism in, is a in, component? In the Air Force more than other places, but yes, I do. I think, we, in the we, Air Force? Th yes. You know, there's a guy named Mikey Weinstein who's sued about this over and over and over again about, um, you know, religious freedom inside the services, and it's particularly the Air Force has been taken over. At least this is, my dad is 10 years old here, but... Uh, from what I'd heard before, he had real holy rollers who believe that, yeah, nuclear war will help force Jesus to come back and all this kind right, of stuff. We, so and there are people who really believe that with power and influence in this yeah, country. That, that and, and it's 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 tough because I think Occam's razor is always there's money to be made for the military industrial complex. There's power to be had. There's grudges. There's generational conflict. But we are. I bring this up because. There are uh, uh, people pushing this rumor. And, and you know, I think Jen kind of took it the wrong way when I said that uh, there's videos of people claiming, you know, Israel is the blessed Holy Land, members of Congress saying this, and many people who believe that there has to be this war for there to be the messianic era or whatever. I'm not talking about any of these anti-Semitic conspiracy theories about world control or dominance. I'm talking about people who generally just believe the Bible. Sure. And the Bible says that there'll be this great war. There's been uh, people have been taught there's a uh, uh, forward. Uh, I think it was forward.com wrote about the red heifer that was born. I'm not saying I believe any of that is true. I'm wondering to what degree does a lot of people are very deeply religious. I'm wondering to what degree that influences their actions. I, I think it has. I guess I would say in the in the councils of the highest levels of the Pentagon and the White House, I don't think that they have that much influence, but in the nation. In the country overall, they do. And in the Republican Party and in the Congress, they absolutely do. I mean, look, after September 11th, Colin Powell told George Bush, just like James Baker told his father, your approval rating is through the roof. We have to do a Palestinian state now. Now is the time. This is one of the main causes of terrorism against our country is the Israelis' oppression of the Palestinians. And Bush was convinced, and they started to do it. Wow. And then what happened was Tom DeLay, the House Majority Whip, from Texas came to W. Bush and said, you want to be a one-term president like your father? Because I'll turn every born-again evangelical Christian in this country against you and you will be toast. Why do, and, you think the, uh, why do you think the Palestinians have for so long, even going back to the founding of Israel, rejected 
a two-state solution. Even the one Bill Clinton proposed, I think, in 92, that was really generous well, and, and pretty strong and would have given them a lot. We're skipping around a lot here. Sure, but, but if I'm, you, I'm if, just asking your it, opinion on that. Okay, I mean, if you want to go back to the beginning of it, it was because this, what, 11% of the population were claiming to own half the land, more than half the land, and everyone else was going to have to get the hell out of the way. What and about all violently, the There have been so many. Violently massacring them and cleansing them from their homes. And so they said no. But then what happened? I mean, first of all, well, there's a lot of first of alls here. But what happened was Israel made a secret deal with the king of Jordan that he would keep the West Bank. And then at the end of the war, they had Egypt keep the Gaza Strip just so that the Palestinians could not have their state. So quite contrary to this myth, that Israel has done nothing but try to give the Palestinians independence all this time. I'm talking they, about the American proposals. There have been a lot of American proposals. Well, that was in 92, but you asked about right. 48. Right, first. I'm saying, so why, I'm saying why have they rejected it all along? Like you're saying it's a different reason each time. Well, I mean, to skip from 48 to 92 is tough. And there's obviously a lot at issue here. If you want to do, let me do the, the narrative in the broad okay, stroke thing, it. okay? So, so picture your map of, of Israel and Palestine that you have in your head right now. In the 1948 war, I mean, forget morality and normative, just descriptive, okay? Israel won the war and they cleansed 750,000 Palestinians out of what we now call Israel proper within the 67 borders, okay? And they push them into other nations across the Middle East, and they push them into the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. Uh, and they took as far as West Jerusalem, okay? Now, regardless of, you know, who you sympathize with or whatever, just factually speaking, that was sustainable. What they created was sustainable in the sense that they created an 80-20 super duper majority Jewish democracy. You had 80% Jews, 20% Palestinian Muslims and Christians inside Israel. We're talking about now, not the occupied territories. And this is after the Six Day War? This is after the... Um, Wasn't that 67? No, no, I'm, I'm talking before 67. Oh, I thought you were talking about 67. Okay. Oh, yeah. No, so 67 is next, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So before 67, they had created essentially this 80-20 super duper majority Jewish democracy. Then in the 67 war, which was started by Israel, they claimed it was preemptive. Regardless, Israel won the war. The Palestinians, of course, had nothing to do with it. They were just stuck in the middle. Um, but Israel beat Jordan and Egypt and Syria in that war. And they took the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. Mm -hmm. And you could say, guys, that look, they really de facto annexed all of Gaza and the West Bank then. Yeah, but they Egypt kept, was pissed, for but sure. They, but they kept all the people. So unlike in 1948, where they drove all the people off their land and created this 80-20 super-duper majority <laughs> Jewish state. They let everyone stay in their they, homes. Well, they couldn't force them all out. They actually did force 235,000 people out of their homes, more out of their homes. But they still, overall, they kept the people of the West Bank. So they're essentially kidnapped now, right? So they are, they are, they were conquered. Were they in, kidnapped or they were let to stay where they lived? Well, it's sort of the same thing in a sense. I mean, I'm, it's a turn of phrase here that I'm using. But mm -hmm. what, I'm, what I'm trying to tell you is that Palestine, the, the Palestinian people have had nothing like independence this whole time. They've been under the occupation of Israel first the, under Jordan and Egypt, and then under Israel since 67. Okay, so when like Ben Shapiro, for example, or my friend here last night on Twitter says, well, what would we do if the Mexicans were attacking us across our international border here? Cartels. Well, even well, then. we'd do nothing because we are being attacked. Right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not, not with rockets. Yeah, I mean, by cartels and we but, do nothing. So we let 7 we million We open the border in. for them. We what? open the, we kiss them on the cheeks. What, what? <laughs> Well, we give them Xboxes and tents. We let them populate Central Park. All right, let's do the southern border in a minute. Um, <laughs> but so un unlike in the Ben Shapiro analogy, which everybody's heard a million times, there is no international border here. E see, when you, most people, I'm not saying in this room, but I just mean in America, generally speaking, if you say the Israelis and the Palestinians, well, it sounds like the Palestinians already have a country because everybody has a country. 
And you just called them Palestinians, so they must be from the country called Palestine, right? That's it. No. You got a bug right behind you on your chair there, buddy. Oh, yeah. Those little stink bugs, they do their thing. Uh, He is actually cute. Friendly little guy. He was over here for a while. So what happened was... um, the uh <laughs> blasted him the, he's alive though i just blew him off with the so so since 67 they've been under occupation now david ben gurion the first prime minister said this is crazy we shouldn't do this we should let them go right now we don't want to essentially in a way again accept my turn of phrase import by expanding their territory they're in a sense, importing this massive population of Palestinian Muslims and Christians that they don't want. And so well, David Ben Gurion. Jordan doesn't want them. Egypt doesn't want them. No one wants them. Well, and that's partially because if the Israeli Jews are able to cleanse all of historic Palestine of all their Muslim population, then they lose all their claim to their holy sites. It's their land that they want to keep. They were the ones who were there first. They're the ones being cleansed well, from is, their land by the Israelis. Mean, well, first means they were living there all along. But what, like, and what, 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 for, for generations back into antiquity, when a bunch of Russians and Lithuanians and Germans and New Yorkers showed up and said the land belonged to them. Antiquity? And yeah, into yeah, ancient times. In fact, here, I'm glad this has come up because I got a great quote for you here. I've been talking about this lately, but I had forgotten what the actual source was. But what you're saying But the you're, actual you're, source is David Ben Gurion himself. You're, you're, you're saying that who that said it, uh Muslims always always uh, well, had there, this land. had been there. That's right, because here's why. Because when the Muslims came and took over that land, they did not cleanse the land of the people who lived there. All, and they did not invade it with a giant occupying force to replace them. All they did was take them over and tax them. And then the deal was, if you convert to Islam, you get a uh, tax cut. Basically, you pay less. And so the local uh, people all converted to Islam by force, and this, well, and yeah, essentially, but yeah, by coercion, right? Yeah, it's by and, and so, but wait, but so these are the same people who are the descendants of the ancient Hebrews, and the source for this is David Ben Gurion himself. Okay, this is from Sheldon Richmond's book, which we published at the Institute. And Sheldon, my good friend, was raised Jewish and Zionist until he learned all of this stuff. And he wrote this great book, Coming to Palestine, about it. And and on page eleven and twelve here, he quotes David Ben Gurion. And his partner, Yitzhak ben who is Israel's second president, and, and who was also a professional historian, and they wrote a book in 1918 called Eretz Israel, In the Past and in the Present. And in there, I won't read you the whole quote, but in there, they describe in detail, ben, uh, Ben-Gurion says, the ancient Hebrews never left. So, so you can't take a farmer from his soil. They were there the whole time. And so the, what was happening was the descendants of the ancient Hebrews in, who had stayed in Palestine were being replaced by the descendants of the ancient Hebrews who'd gone off to Europe and then their descendants came home. As though there's no statute of limitations. And 3,000 years later, you can come and say, this is my land, you can't live here. When, But if the, if the argument is one people conquered another people, then all you're ar- arguing now is another people are conquering another people, right? Like, well, that's yeah. right. But, but look, I'm not okay with any of it, but I understand it happened. And I, you know, I, I wonder what the solutions would be well, when we're trying right. to minimize so, casualties. Look, I mean, all we're trying to do here is describe the reality of the situation, Tim. Most of the time, again, if you listen to Ben Shapiro, which many people do, you would think there already was some kind of two-state solution. And now the nation state of Palestine has sent its terrorist forces to attack and invade Israel, when that's not what happened. What happened was, essentially... Indians broke out of their reservation and attacked the people in town. What, and that's not a fight between sovereigns. That's a fight essentially between refugees in a prison camp versus the nation state that conquered them. And when you at least it, explain... It was against, it's against the population because they did go after innocent people. That's right. Of course they did. And, and let's talk about that in just a second. But just overall, just the situation of who's attacking who and, and the relative power. Like, if America went to war with Mexico, that wouldn't be a fair fight. But at least they have a national government and a national army. I just, that's I, different. That would be a, I, that would I, be a but, fair fight, that's, but I, sure. But I, but that's I just, different I, than if we just start carpet right, but, bombing the Navajo reservation out in Arizona. But, I mean, imagine, imagine some, some Indians in the reservation out west go into town and massacre a thousand Anglos. 
Do we carpet bomb the reservation? Or we find the people who are responsible and their commanders uh, the who Navajo, sent them? If the Navajo massacred a thousand Americans off the reservation? Yeah, it'd be federally occupied. What they'd would wipe we out do? The, they'd, they'd wipe out the reservation. We, no, no, yeah. we would not eat. Occupy. No, we would not. We, we sure occupy. would. No, we would. Yeah, we, we would. would. No, we would be occupied. We would find the individuals responsible and the men who sent them, and we would hold them to account. A thousand they would Americans. Be, they would be. They would be prosecuted in criminal court. We killed a million people to death. in Iraq. Yeah, because, yeah. Of, because it's <laughs> September 11th. We massacred everybody at Waco and Ruby Ridge for far less. Well, like this, and, this is not an and, endorsement and they, of it. And look, they killed a hell of a lot of Indians at Wounded yeah. Knee too, and and second Wounded Knee. However, okay, wait, well, wait, let, me Indians, let me rephrase it. Let me rephrase it. Would you support too. would you support carpet bombing an Indian reservation over an atrocity when you know good and damned well that the FBI and the Marshal Service can handle this? No. You're going to send in the military and and are, you know you, you're going to kill innocent people. If you're saying that if you're saying that the Navajo Nation which struggles to have electricity and refrigeration just to afford... Like the people of Gaza? No, like the people of the Navajo Nation, the Navajo Hopi Reservation, right? Like there's solar panel structures to keep refrigerators going to make sure that they have insulin, the insulin stays cold. If you're saying that these people, if they, if like there was a, if there was a militia to the point where um, they had a militia and they decided to murder a thousand Americans. I think that, that would, first of all, that would be really shocking. And I would think very long and hard about the, the structure of the, um, you know, well, that's well, a great well, point. Me, you would me, wonder me, what they were so upset the, about. The, interior, yeah, let the let me, Department of the Interior. Question. No, I wouldn't worry what they were upset about, but I, well, on, let, let, I would. Well, I, maybe Hillary Clinton sold their uranium to the Russians and they all got cancer and they're actually upset and got something to fight about. Let me let me literally answer the question instead of just going back and forth. Um, if the Navajo Nation mounted a raid that killed 1,000 Americans, it's not it's not some arbitrary question of carpet bombing them. It's a question of military capabilities, what we expect in terms of future actions against us and what um, amounts to justice. I would be quite concerned with the carpet bomb on the Navajo Re reservation because they don't have support from Iran or they don't have access to rockets. They're not produced. We're, we're not being bombed by them consistently. Rockets aren't launching out of various areas. We don't need to do that. Yes, the marshals and U.S. forces could go in there. Yeah, but even if they were armed with rockets, I mean, look, we call them rockets because you don't dare call them missiles because they're not real missiles and they didn't get shipped from Iran. They made them out of water pipes, right? They're, these are, you know, uh, barely amount to Katusha rockets. The fact, look, the reason it's so important that we talk about the difference between, uh, you know, whether if, we're talking about a sovereign nation or an Indian reservation, what you're supposed to take from that is everybody in this country knows that the great white father back east, Joe Biden, and his armed forces have one billion times the strength and the power of any Indians on any reservation, and that if they did break out and commit some terrible atrocity, that Uncle Sam ought to be able to negotiate a peaceful solution from here. And again, the individuals responsible would be prosecuted in court. It wouldn't be a war. I, they, I, would go to, they would go to court and then they'd be hanged. Michael Reinel. And was he, was he given his day in court? Who's that? The guy who shot Aaron Danielson in Portland. I don't in know. 2020, I mean, the Branch the Davidians didn't get their day in court either, right. but they should have. Should have. They should have. I do not expect the U.S. government to be honest yeah. and bear integrity when dealing with these things. Did 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 did, I mean, did people at, of Iraq get a fair trial after 9/11? The U.S. just decided to lie to wage war overseas, which resulted in untold deaths, and we're still pissed off about it. Uh, it, it was it was an insane move that we went to Afghanistan in Iraq over 9/11. 9/11 was an atrocity. Uh, that this country and uh, uh, for, for this country, everybody knows that. And 3000 people lost their lives. The stories that come out of 9-11 are uh, they're stories of great heroism, which inspire. But the whole day was just so horrifying. And the reaction was just untold more dead with lies. The U.S. did not have a fair day in court. I, I, I fully expect evil actions uh, it should should something like that occur. I wish it yeah, was. Yeah, but dude, you're talking about a bunch of Egyptians and Saudi 
nationals who hijack planes working for a foreign terrorist group. Right. In and my then they went analogy, to war in two wait, wait, countries. Wait. No, we're talking about Indians on the reservation because we're talking about Israel and the Palestinians. That's not the same as Al Qaeda attacking us on an international jihad. We're talking about look, in, the point about bringing up the Navajo is not to impugn the Navajo, it's to point out that they are already licked. They're already beaten. They live in a concentration camp under the total control of the United States government. But they can so leave. If, so if wait, something... Wait, wait, hold, hold on. Like, uh, well, no. I, look, it's not a perfect analogy, but I'm just saying the relative power versus the Indians on the res versus the U.S. federal government means if something very terrible happens, the onus should be on the American national authorities to resolve it peacefully from there I dis not to call in the army to wipe out a bunch of innocent men women and children and look at the history of israel and palestine here where they've had problems with terrorism from the leftists from the nationalists from the islamists the whole time and how do they handle it they went in, they get them What's, one what? at a time. It's only since so, so, Netanyahu so, so, so. that they do these massive bombing campaigns. You can go in. Again, we're talking right, about a reservation. Break, you can let's, go let's, in and let's, pick these guys off one at a time. So you think the response to from the Hamas attack would be for Israel to do like strategic incursion with forces to remove Hamas? Yes, they should listen to That's what to AOC it. said. They yeah. should. I don't care about that. Listen, what you just said was that America got all emotional and did a bunch of stupid wrong things Absolutely. after September 11th. Israel ought to listen to you, and they ought to not do that. They yeah. ought to be smart. And look, I wrote an article a couple of weeks ago, and, and we do need to get into why Netanyahu likes Hamas so much and supported them in Palestine, uh, because that's a huge part of this, okay? Yeah. Because we, get, we keep getting distracted off our points, and probably that's mostly my fault. But... Um, uh, and hell, now I forgot what I was going to say about we're that. Talking about the, you were you were leading to the comment, uh, the the link you sent, which is something that I was. Oh, the reaction. The, yes, the reaction. Yes, the reaction. Okay, so Saul Alinsky stuff. So look, okay, yes, you guys are familiar with Saul Alinsky, the Very. leftist radical yep. community organizer guy, right? Okay, page seventy four of Rules for Radicals says that in all asymmetric political action, the action is in the reaction of the opposition. Yeah. Right. So like bin Laden has a group of 400 bandits. He's trying to take on the superpower. How do you do it? You get the superpower to kill itself. Right. Right. You give them an opportunity to go wild and do something self-destructive. OK. In this case, Hamas was trying. And probably there are people who are siding with the Palestinians who might not want to hear this part of it. The reason that Hamas committed the atrocity that they committed you on, mean on October, October 7th? the 7th. Yes. On October the 7th, which, by the way. An extended family member of mine was abducted and murdered by Hamas in that atrocity. Condolences. Okay. And and by the way, my wife almost would have died on September 11th, except she was homesick at her parents' house. Wow. But she had an office in the tower wow. and would have been killed on September 11th. Okay. So I don't have any love or sympathy for these armed Islamist murderers. That's exactly what they are. Okay. But they're not just devils and they're not just angry children. And Muhammad didn't come from hell to give them instructions to do a bad thing. These are human men, and they're fighting about politics. So why okay? did why'd they do it? So why they did it was to provoke Netanyahu into doing exactly what he's doing now. Carpet bombing the Gaza Strip, slaughtering Gazan Palestinian civilians by the thousands. So Hamas knew civilians. that this would result Hamas in a massacre of their own that. people. That's exactly so they right. Well, 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 that's, 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 that's right. Wait, 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 wait. First, Let me finish now. Real quick, one point for your question. Of course Hamas knew. Right, of now, course now, they did. Now, motivations aside, I, they, uh, there's, there's no other reaction. But not continue. just right. they knew. Not just, the, mm -hmm. they, not just they knew. This is what they wanted to happen. Okay? Absolutely. Because with the reaction, then comes all the counter reactions. Right. So what, how we start the show at the top of the show today, America hits Iranian sites in Syria because they had sent drones yep. after our guys in Syria because of what Israel is doing in Gaza. Right. It, at the Lebanese border with Hezbollah, you got so far just pot shots going off back and forth, but that could quickly escalate. Wait, wait, wait. Now, every Shiite militia in Iraq has to take a stand. The Ayatollah in Tehran gets to get up there and beat his chest. Now, every Sunni king in Arabia, all of the American sock puppets, Mohammed bin uh, Salman and, and Mohammed bin Zayed 
in in Saudi and in UAE. They all have to take a stand. Are they going to be silent uh, because they're good little sock puppets of the empire? Or are they going to agree with 100% of the public opinion of the people in their countries? This could destabilize the whole region. It's already... Remember when I was here yep. a year and a half ago, we talked about the Abraham Accords. Yep. And what was the purpose of the Abraham Accords? This was the Netanyahu doctrine that said we can, with enough American tax money, <laughs> we can make peace, well, not peace, but we can finally permanently normalize relations with Bahrain, UAE, not Bahrain, with... Uh, it was UAE. Yes, Bahrain, Saudi UAE, Arabia. Saudi, Sudan, mm -hmm. and Morocco. That's right. And we can do this without... Without making the peace with the Palestinians. Right. That's right. And so, and, and that in fact, the pal Palestinians before, pissed off. And so they right. took a couple of years to plan this attack. That's right. Yep. And then, and then look what happened. They, they got the reaction that they wanted. And now that all of the Abraham the Accords are in jeopardy. Right. And look, and this is, let's, let's get real honest about here, uh, about this. Even if you absolutely love Israel, and I don't know any reason why not to, it's a land full of civilians. I love them just as much as everybody else. Okay. You wouldn't wish you wouldn't you would not wish Netanyahu on the people of Israel. He has been the longest serving prime minister in Israeli history, longer than uh, than David Ben Gurion. Okay, they call him King Bibi. And so, like, think if September 11th had happened in Bill Clinton's third term. His approval rating would have gone down, right? <laughs> Bush got was off the hook because he'd only been on the job yeah. for eight measly months before that attack happened on his watch, right? This is happening in Netanyahu's fifth term, okay? This is his policy finally come to fruition. It was called the Netanyahu Doctrine. And the Netanyahu Doctrine said, unlike Yitzhak Rabin, who one of his fans assassinated in 1995, Unlike Yitzhak Rabin, who said, we want to demonize Iran so that we can negotiate and make peace with the Arabs, including the Palestinians. The Netanyahu doctrine said, no, we'll make peace with the Arabs, demonize Iran, make peace with the Arabs, but not with the Palestinians. And you can hear him just three weeks ago in his United Nations address. He explains exactly the thinking mm -hmm. behind this. He says, they always said that we could never... Um, uh, normalize relations with the rest of the nations of the region uh, and, and uh, therefore then have peace with the Palestinians unless we make peace with the Palestinians first and give up a Palestinian state first and only then will we be able to get along. But we showed them and we're so smart and we made these deals without um, giving up a Palestinian state and he said, but we will have peace and what he's essentially saying between the lines is we're going to have the peace of total victory here. The Palestinians will get nothing and they'll learn to like it. I they'll got, never have independence and they'll never have freedom. I got some trivia for you. Uh, and then this happened two weeks after he said that. What or is, one week after he said that at the UN. Look at me. I got, I got, I got away with it, everybody. I got, he said. I got some, I got some trivia Ayatollah for you guys. Khomeini, uh, called for I got I got I got some trivia for you. Okay. What is what does this mean? That's peace. This is victory. Right, but the the origin of this sand sign is the same oh. thing. F U. The, the, it's making the V for victory. And so what happens is after the battle, when they hold up the two fingers, we call it peace. Why? Because you killed all your enemies. Yeah. The peace, peace of has, desolation. The peace has been achieved. We've won. And so when people are like, peace out, the origin of that is after your enemy was killed, you held up the V yeah. for victory. I always thought that this was <laughs> this was F you because the archers would hold up two They'd fingers be like, because oh. when they when they ca got caught, they would cut off one of the fingers so they oh. couldn't pull the. But that's where this comes from. Ouch. The, this which, is which people now say peace, but the peace is it's uh, peace so after that, you win. Wait, right. So you, this brings us back to the clean break, okay? Because what was the purpose of of getting rid of Saddam so that we can weaken Hezbollah? It was so that we don't have to abide by the Oslo Agreement and negotiate an independent Palestinian state. But if we screw over the Palestinians while we still have Hezbollah on our northern border, then that's an extra pressure. And so the whole point of the clean break strategy was we need to get America to 
go to war in Iraq for us so that we don't have to give justice to the Palestinians. You- Thanks for watching this clip from the Timcast IRL podcast. Hang out with us live Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. and become a member over at Timcast.com for uncensored members only shows exclusive. Thanks for hanging out and we'll see you all next time.